So if you've ever wondered what it takes to build a worldview, one of the things that you're going to want to do when you build a worldview is you're going to want to have a worldview that explains as many things as possible and that leaves as many things unexplained as possible. So you want to explain everything that can be explained and you want to leave as many things unexplained as possible. But this raises the question, how many worldviews can actually do that? How many so-called grand theories of everything are actually on the table? And if there's a lot, what does that mean for the plausibility of the worldviews that we're discussing? And if there's only a few, what does that mean for the chances of one of these worldviews being true? Today, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Ted Post Poston of the University of Alabama about all of these questions. And before I get into that, I want to let you guys know by clicking any of the links in the description, specifically the GoFundMe link, you can help support me in furthering my education. Uh, now with that out of the way, Dr. Post Poston, uh, would you just begin by telling me a little bit about your academic background and what got you interested in the topic that we're going to be discussing today? Sure, I'm happy to. So first off, just thanks for having me on. So uh, <clears throat> I grew up in a household uh, where my father was a scientist and a pastor. So these questions about how faith and reason intersect were, you know, very, you know, important and pressing to me, you know, growing up. And I actually didn't know that there existed, you know, philosophy, you know, as a, as a, as a student, I mean, you learn like math and English. I had no idea, you know, that, um, people talked about these big questions, like, how do you know stuff, you know, like, uh, how do you argue for various claims? And so one of the really influential parts for me was just going to college and taking a philosophy course and realizing like, oh, wow, there's this whole discipline of people asking these big questions. Mm -hmm. And so that got me, you know, that you just sort of got me, you know, with this philosophy bug. And I ended up uh, going to um, actually seminary where I did a uh, dual uh, MDiv and MA program. And while I was doing that, you know, I realized that I just really wanted to study academic philosophy. So I was very fortunate to get into a halfway decent, you know, MA program and do my PhD in philosophy. Um, as we were talking earlier, you know, I had the opportunity to work with Richard Swinburne my second year in grad school. And so, you know, I've always been really interested in questions of like, how can you argue for these uh, big grand theories? And uh, Swinburne's, you know, approach of using confirmation theory, thinking about explanation and probabilities as a way of approaching this just really fit with, you know, uh, my interest. And I thought it was a very, um, you know, successful and uh, useful way to approach these issues. Gotcha. Now, you talked about doing your training in um, a seminary, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And you were doing theology mainly. What Was there a specific topic that really made you say, okay, now I'm going to like specialize in philosophy? Yeah, so actually I took a... Uh, a uh, uh, grad course in seminary called The Theory of Knowledge. And so we read uh, Roger Chisholm's book, The Theory of Knowledge, which is this classic uh, presentation of like contemporary 20th century epistemology. We read um, a book by John Pollock called Contemporary Theories of Knowledge. And then we read the first two Plantinga volumes. So this is okay. Warren, the current debate and warrant proper function. And just, I don't know what it was about that stuff. I mean, I was hooked as soon as I read the Chisholm. Okay. You know, I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. this talks my language. Where, where has this been all my life? Gotcha. Was the, was the original intention to go into seminary and then uh, ultimately go on to pastoral work? Yeah, you know, so my dad was a pastor and, you know, he also taught, um, you know, uh, community college and co taught, you know, at various colleges throughout the year, throughout, you know, his pastorate. And so I thought I'd do something similar, you know, I thought, that I'd be a pastor. And then, you know, if I had an MA in philosophy of religion, I'd be able to teach, you know, at, at you know, colleges off and on. But, I, you know, that's what I was thinking. Gotcha. So a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of both, you know. Good. All right. So uh, today we're going to be talking about what you call grand theories of everything. I, I'm using the term worldview for sure, short, but I know that that's yeah. a very loaded term. And I, I don't know. I think grand theory of everything is probably a, a loaded term too. But uh, yeah. so we're talking about grand theories of everything. Uh, why don't you just begin by telling us what is it that we want a grand theory of everything to do for us? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So we should start off by just saying what a grand theory is, right? So a grand theory is a theory that explains the nature and the, well, explains the existence and the nature of the world, right? So we want some sort of account that says, okay, well, why does the universe exist? Maybe there's no explanation. Well, that would be um, a theory, right? Um, Maybe it has an explanation. What could that explanation be, right? Um, why does the universe have the features that we see it, um, that we observe it to have? You know, why is it the case that apparently um, 
you know, our universe uh, began, right, in an initial singularity that exploded out. And it has all these special properties that are, you know, summarized in the, you know, the natures of the fundamental laws, right, and the rate of expansion, cosmological constant and stuff and such. Mm -hmm. And so these are questions that, you know, as human beings, it's natural for us to try to figure out, okay, so why? you know, does this stuff exist? And so that's what a grand theory is. It's a theory that purports to explain the existence and the nature of the universe. And then we want to think, okay, well, <clears throat> we know what a grand theory is. What is it to explain something? And broadly, there are two approaches to explanation. So there's scientific explanation and there's personal explanation. <clears throat> so scientific explanation works by, you know, citing uh, some initial conditions, right, and some law, some you know, way of trans transitioning from those initial conditions to the phenomena that's supposed to be explained. But it's it's crucial with scientific explanation that it always uh, works by uh, positing an initial state, mm -hmm. right? And with a grand theory, one of the um, moves on offer is like, okay, why uh, does the universe have this, you know, <laughs> why does the universe exist, you know? Uh, if there is an initial state of the universe, where did it come from? Right? And personal explanation is different from scientific explanation. I mean, it does proceed um, in terms of, you know, a state and some sort of transition, but it works in terms of, you know, explaining why something exists in terms of beliefs and desires, right? So if you want to explain, you know, uh, why I went to the fridge and got the, you know, bluebell ice cream, you're going to talk about, well, I believe that there was bluebell ice cream in the fridge and I like bluebell ice cream. And so I intended to go eat some and, and so on. Right. Um, so in general, that's what explanations in you know, that's sort of the broad category for how explanations work. Um, and then what explanations offer is they offer um, a sense of understanding. Right. And so what we wanted out of a grand theory of the universe is to um, explain Right? The existence and nature of the universe that gives us some sort of understanding of why it exists uh, and why it has the character that it has. Mm -hmm. And so what we'll see as we continue to talk, you know, later on is that um, I think there are um, several uh, plausible grand theories of the universe that do that. Mm -hmm. And then we can use various judgments we have about those theories to try to figure out how good of an explanation they offer. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, judging the virtues of these different theories in a little bit. But so what we have right now is we have the universe. So we want to explain why that's there. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. starting point one. And then the second thing is we want to get in there why the universe is the way it is. So anything that you think is a feature of the universe, we also want to explain that. And then there's going to be different theories about the different actual um, features of the universe. And so you have yeah. these two kinds of explanations, these scientific explanations, but they all kind of have a starting point within the natural universe. And then you have these personal explanations in terms of beliefs, desires, and intentions. So yep. before we get to listing off um, some of these uh, grand theories of explanation, I want you to tell me a little bit about simplicity because typically people regard uh, uh, explanation that is simple as being a virtuous explanation. So why do people yep. typically regard simplicity as being a theoretical virtue? Yeah. So. Uh... The, the quick answer to the question is, is that um, the evidence that we have, the data, always underdetermines what is the correct interpretation or what, what is really going on uh, behind the data. So an easy way to think about this is like the curve fitting problem, right? So if you're, you know, doing a graph, you know, and you've got various data and you want to figure out how the data is connected, right? The general idea is, well, draw the smoothest line you can. Right, through the data. But like, you know, you can draw a smooth line, you can draw a really bumpy line. I mean, you can draw circles within circles within circles, right? So, you know, there's all different ways to connect the data by various theories, but the data themselves, right, um, don't uniquely pick out what the um, correct theory is. And so one way this is talked about is people distinguish between what are called the um, you know, the empirical virtues and the non-empirical virtues. And so simplicity is what's known as a non-empirical virtue, where it's not something that, you know, you see in the data, right, itself. It's, it's a, um, 
way of um, picking out what we think of as the best theory. Mm -hmm. And so people argue a couple different ways uh, for, for you know, using simplicity as a criteria for theory choice. I mean, one uh, way is uh, swing priorities, it's just indispensable, right? You're always going to have to um, uh, use simplicity, right? So you're trying to think about, you know, all right, well, I've got two theories uh, for, you know, why the crime happened. One is, you know, a person with means, motive, and opportunity committed the crime. And another is 10 people, right, as a collective. Right, committed the crime. One person did this, one person did that, one person did that. And if the evidence doesn't tell, um, distinguish between the two, right, you can think, well, the 10 person theory is much less um, plausible, right? Yeah. The one person's theory, it, it can account for everything, right, without positing extra entities. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and then, you know, another main people, another main reason people um, argue for simplicity is they, they say, well, just look at the history of science. I mean, history of science is full of examples where people, in fact, reason in accord with uh, simplicity. So Newton's right uh, three laws and the gravitational law is an example of using simplicity to try to figure out, okay, well, you know, what's the what's the simplest way we can explain all the relevant phenomena that we observe in the universe? Gotcha. So the reason that will appeal to simplicity when it's coming to judging these virtues or when it comes to judging these theories is because the data tends to be underdetermined. So I like the, the analogy of, you know, drawing a graph. You have all these different data points to plot. You know, the easiest yeah. thing to do is just a smooth curve through all yeah. of these data points. Yep. And uh, according to Swinburne, it seems like this is indispensable. I mean, it, it almost seems intuitive that we're always going to at least think the simplest explanation for whatever reason is going yeah. to be the most plausible. Now, uh, you bring out in your paper that there are some problems uh, with strictly, I guess, using simplicity uh, as an approach to judging uh, these, uh, the virtue of these explanations. So what do you take to be the uh, problems with this approach? Yeah, so, so there's a famous problem called the Guru problem, which I talk about in, in the paper, right? And the Guru problem, uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting problem. So you sample a whole bunch of emeralds, right? And you find out that all emeralds are... Um, I can never remember the color of actual emeralds. Are they green or are they blue? I think you said green in the paper. Yeah. Yeah. So that all emeralds are green, right? And you think, okay, well, um, you know, that seemed to be well supported by the evidence. Um, we've sampled a whole bunch of emeralds and they're all green. But what's interesting about um, the GRU problem is like how you think of some evidence as uh, supporting a theory depends on how you describe that evidence. Mm -hmm. So the philosopher who introduced um, the GRU problem is Nelson Goodman. And he introduced the predicate called GRU. Uh, GRU is a, a predicate that applies to uh, things that are blue and observed before, say, 2025, or, or no, green and observed before 2025, or blue afterwards, right? And so what's interesting about that predicate is you can describe your sample as being um, all uh, green emeralds, but you can also describe your sample as being all GRU emeralds, right? And then the question is, okay, well, if um, the sample is an instance of all green uh, emeralds, that supports the generalization that all emeralds are green, but also the sample is an instance of, um, uh, of all the emeralds being GRU. And so that would support the generalization that all emeralds are GRU. But notice that uh, if it does support the generalization that all emeralds are GRU, then after 2025, when you sample emeralds, right, you find just uh, blue emeralds instead of green as the other um, one, um, uh, um, you know, supports. So the, so the, the issue here is, 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 is interesting. Is like, why do we think that um, uh, our sample actually supports the green hypothesis over the GRU hypothesis. And one uh, answer, in fact, the answer that Nelson uh, Goodman gives is he says, well, it's just more natural for us to infer, right, the green hypothesis than the GRU hypothesis, right? So people who advocate for simplicity say, look, no, 
naturalness has more to do with human psychology, mm -hmm. right? And so we think that, um, that, you know, defenders of simplicity think, no, it's a logical fact about the sa sample that it supports the grain hypothesis. And that logical fact, right, is um, something to do with simplicity, okay? So this is kind of a long story, but I want to want to just explain sort of some of the background to what the problem is. The problem is simplicity can't be just a natural virtue. It has to be something like a logical virtue. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, in virtue of being a logical virtue, it should have some sort of analysis or some sort of nature. And the, ma the main problem is that there's just not an analysis of simplicity. It seems much more... Um, much more like a natural judgment gotcha. than uh, something that has, you know, kind of logical nature. Okay, one second. All right, so just to make sure I follow it. So okay. you, have th you have this group problem, and on this group problem, I mean, both of these explanations that, you know, the emerald has the property of being green, and the emerald has the property of being green up until 2025 before it turns blue, um, are basically empirically equivalent for what it's worth. Uh, yeah. So why yeah. should we prefer green over blue? Goodman says, well, because it's just more natural. Or green over gru is just because it's more natural. Yeah. And so what you're saying is, well, there has to be something more to it than it's just more natural. We have to, I guess, dig into that a little bit. Yeah, the advocates for simplicity-based approaches are thinking, no, no, naturalness is too subjective. Yeah, okay. That's not going to give us a sound enough basis for preferring the green hypothesis over the gru hypothesis. Okay. So we have to invoke a more objective evidential virtue. Okay. And then, okay, well, that means simplicity, okay. right? So. And then that, and that point, I think a lot of people are on board is like, yeah, if there was this thing, mm -hmm. right, this property of simplicity, that was this logical evidential, you know, virtue, mm -hmm. uh, then yeah, it could favor yeah. uh, the green hypothesis over the guru hypothesis. But the problem, the main problem with simplicity is that, um, it just, it, no one has come up with right, a good analysis yeah. of um, what simplicity is. And so there, there are a lot more particular problems that you can, uh -huh. you can, you know, point to like in the paper, um, you know, I um, argue that, well, you know, Swinburne to get out of the group problem wants to think that uh, a criteria for simplicity is closeness to observation, mm -hmm. right? So green is much uh, more easily to observe than GRU. Yeah. And then I pointed out some problems, you know, with that kind of approach because, um, you know, it just closeness to observation doesn't seem like a um, evidential virtue. It seems more like a heuristic virtue, just yeah. easier for us yeah. to check. Yeah. And then it also kind of can work at cross purposes to what he wants to do when he wants to argue uh, that God's a simple hypothesis and God is something that's removed from you know, direct observation. Yeah. So this simplicity uh, theory is going to kind of work against him um, if if he was to, to carry it out on that that criterion, I guess. Yeah. So so okay. So simplicity seems like it needs some unpacking, just like naturalness needs some unpacking. Yeah. Um, and so there might be a little baggage on using that criterion. So how do you propose that we assess, you know, uh, uh, these prior prob the prior probability of these of these theories? Yeah. Yeah. So you know I'm completely in agreement, right? The evidence can't, you know, settle it because of the undetermination problem. And the question is, all right, well, what kind of non-empirical virtue are you going to use? Mm -hmm. And what I propose is um, you think about um, um, how well, or, you know, the explanatory problems that a theory has. Okay. Right? And you use contingency judgments to think about, well, you know, how many unanswered questions, right, um, does a theory uh, have? Right. And so uh, we can take, you know, just, you know, think about, for example, polytheism, right? If there were a fundamental feature of the universe that something like the Greek, um, like Greek mythology were true, I think we would have a number of um, unanswered questions, right? Why are there, say, I don't know how many um, Greek gods and goddesses there are, but why are there 13 and not 12, you know, not 14? Mm -hmm. You know, why is it that you know, uh, one, um, you know, goddess has the virtue of wisdom and another, you know, God has like control over the seeds, you know, 
And why isn't it absolute control over the seas? Why is yeah. it limited control? You know, and so on. And so you have these um, these features of Greek mythology that themselves seem to be brutally contingent. Yeah. You know, and they're puzzling. Yeah. And Plato uh, himself, you know, pokes fun at some of these uh, you know features of Greek mythology. He's thinking, you know, look, these can't really be fundamental features of the universe because they just they're just too too weird, too strange. You yeah. Know? So you are going to assess it. I, I call this the pot, the, the post uh, criteria. So <laughs> we want a minimal number of, of limitations within our explanation or contingencies within our explanation. Yeah. So like, for example, polytheism, like, why do you have just a hundred and like, for example, 23 gods? Like, what is it going to explain the existence of these 123 gods? Um, yeah. And so is that like, basically the judgment um just kind of simply stated yeah yeah you know the i would put it in terms of like limitations cry out for explanation okay so um one example that i often tell people and said i talk to my students about is like well okay so why is it that human beings can't grow above i don't know what the actual you know the limit is but why is it that humans can't be like 30 feet tall yeah. right and it would be a weird feature of the universe if that was just taken as a as a posit. Yeah. It's just like somehow or another, just you know, a, a yeah. law that's just an know, unexplicable fact. Yeah, it's an inexplicable fact. But it's like no, a much deeper understanding is like okay, well, let's think about you know uh, the way the heart works in human beings, and the heart is a pump, right, and it has to move fluid throughout the body, and so if uh, you know, a human was stretched out to be 30 feet tall, the pump would have to work much harder, right? And you think, okay, well, what would that work require? It would require a lot more, you know, forces to be, um, you know, distributed throughout the body. And, you know, that would require a heart that is exponentially bigger, right, than the current human heart. You know, the muscles would be much, have to be much more stronger and human physiology just gotcha. can't support that sort of thing. Gotcha. Right? Um, so that's a structural explanation for some of these facts. And so what I'm thinking is that when you think about fundamental uh, features in the universe, if there are any weird features to it, you want in some sense or another a structural explanation for why it has those features. Okay. You said we want a structural explanation for why it has right. those features. So like in the analogy of the height, you know, you can refer to the heart. And then when referring to the heart, I'm assuming you can go deeper and then deeper into yeah. the structure of these these things. Is that what that means? Yeah, that's exactly right. You can think, well, why is it humans are, you know, are within this, um, okay. you know, uh, their, their heights have this range. You can't go outside that range. Yeah. You can explain that in terms of the way human physiology works, like yeah. the way the heart pumps blood, the way, mm -hmm. you know, the, the veins and arteries, you know, distribute blood throughout the body and so on. Yeah. So we want our grand theory of everything to have the least amount of limitations as possible. So lim because limitations cry out for explanation. Yep. Now, would you consider this, uh, and I, I don't think you do this in the paper, but I'm just out of, out of curiosity, do you consider this to be kind of a an analysis of the intuitive appeal of simplicity or just something outside of the whole simplicity debate? Yeah, and that is a question that people have asked me. And so I'm happy with either way of thinking about it. Uh -huh. So it could be seen as just a friendly amendment to uh, Swinburne's approach, just thinking, you know, in terms of instead of uh, thinking about simplicity in terms of like, you know, the criteria that he gives, like closeness to obs observation, you know, fewer you know, mm -hmm. kinds of properties, fewer, you know, um, uh, tokens and so on. Just think, no, you know, we should just think of simplicity in terms of, um, um, you know, these contingency judgments, you know, yeah. that limitations cry out for. Um, some sort of explanation. So what's really going on with simplicity reasoning, reasoning is that it's a particular kind of explanatory reasoning. Okay. You know, when you're just, well, how contingent, you know, how, how many, you know, unexplained facts, yeah. uh, you know, does it, does it leave? You could go that route or you could think, no, uh, you know, we're just going in a different way. We're just thinking yeah. about explanatory reasoning. And this is just one of the features of explanatory reasoning. And I actually, you know, I mean, I don't have a dog in that fight. You know, I'm just more interested in, you know, this seems like a, a good way of thinking about, um, you know, prior probabilities and, yeah. you know, assessing how plausible theory is. Gotcha. So I'm going to call this the post-in criterion, just to keep it short, you know. So we want 
the least amount of contingencies, and we want uh, basically minimal limitations because these limitations they themselves will cry out for structural explanations. So, yes. given the posting criterion, what do you take to be the exhaustive list, or you know, the potentially exhaustive list yeah. of grand theories of everything? Yeah. So in the paper, what I what I'm doing really is responding to this idea that. Um, the use of explanatory reasoning can't even get off the ground with respect to grand theories because there's an infinite infinite number of grand theories, yeah. right? And so we take a measure of infinite theories that has probability zero, yeah. right? Our infinitesimal probability, and either way, you know, there's just it, it's not going to be possible to yeah. just you know um, you know reason on the basis of inference the best explanation. Yeah. And so that's the main sort of. Uh, target that I'm responding to. So you have this that's, like pool of live options and somebody says, you're never going to get anything that's plausible just based off of these live options because there's, there could be thousands or hundreds. Yeah, there's, yeah. Too, there's too many of them. Yeah. Right. And so, so what I want to do in the paper is I want to say, no, there's not too many. We can use these plausibility, uh, we can use plausibility reasoning to say, look, there's only, you know, uh, a limited number of plausible options. Gotcha. So what I do in the papers, I, I propose that there are three. Now, I don't take this to be exhausted. I just take this to be a way of saying, look, it's a really limited number of options. <laughs> yeah. you know. And so people come back and they'll be like, oh, what about this? What about that? What about that? And I'm like, yeah, okay, I, maybe I could be moved. But now we're up to four. You know, So it's not, or we're up to five. Or okay, or, or now we're up to 100. Yeah. Right? And I'm fine with that. Because you know, if you, you can do explanatory reasoning, that sort of case. Gotcha. I just, you know, I'm just, you know, arguing that it's not infinite. Yeah. Now, and, and this is prior to weighing the evidence. So like just looking at the kind of explanation it is. So I know there's some people that might be thinking, oh, but when you take into account this, then that rules out these things. But we're talking about prior to looking at the evidence, the nature of these explanations, how many grand theories are actually out there. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to make sure I clear about that. So what do you take these theories to be? So I take it to be three. Uh, so naturalism, uh, theism, and a view that it's it's a bit of a strange view, but I think it does have it definitely has um, uh, representatives in uh, contemporary philosophy. But I also think it it taps into a deeper um, kind of view that you find in um, in certain forms of um, you know uh, uh, Eastern uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. So this this view is called. Uh, I called it value monism originally, but it's known as axiarchism. Mm -hmm. So theism, so I guess, well, let me go in yeah. first order, I guess. So axiarchism is the view that the universe is fundamentally normative and uh, there is a creative potential or power to this uh, normativity of the universe. And so the idea is that um, um, goodness, right, exists um, and um, good things exist because they're good. Yeah. Right. So I think that you can find this kind of view in impersonal forms of Hinduism, mm -hmm. right? Where the idea is that the Brahman uh, is not um, is not a person, is not impersonal. It's more of a. I think of it um, along the lines of it's it's it's. <laughs> you can only think of these terms in a kind of an analogy. But it's like the sun that gives out its rays, and yeah. they're warmed in virtue <laughs> yeah. of that. And you know, I mean, it's a weird view, but if you think about uh, its um, its virtues apart from any relevant evidence, you think, okay, one, it posits um, uh, a normative creative force that um, has no limitations, mm -hmm. right? Um, it posits one thing of one kind. Yeah. Right, it explains uh, the existence and the nature of the universe in terms of, right, uh, the normative properties of the universe. Right, yeah. it's good that the universe exists. It's good that it has these features and so on. Um, so, it, so if you look at it on, you know, what you're calling the posting criteria, it does pretty well. Yeah. You know, and so one of the points that I wanted to, you know, sort of get out and using that example is just saying, okay, look, um, you know the the posting criteria aren't sort of like you know um arbitrary here and just trying to pick out certain kinds of theories it's just trying to pick out a general feature of theories which will allow some in some theories that you know are quite different from the way you know we would think but you know um 
seems like a, a decent, you know, yeah. um, contender. Okay. So, so that's axiarchism. Uh, theism, right, is the idea that so they're... Can, can, oh. Yeah, I want to ask a question about axiarchism because it sounds like, uh, I guess, like a, a form of like neoplatonism. So like there's just yeah. the yeah. good emanating itself and, yeah. you know, this is yeah. the impersonal force that can yeah. explain. Yeah, you can maybe see it in, you know, Plato... Okay. Uh, you know, in, in the Republic, you know, and I think it's what, um, like maybe book four or book, book five, the form of the good. Gotcha. Right. So Plato thinks that behind, right, all the forms is his ultimate form of the good. And he's trying to talk about its sort of creative um, potential yeah. um, in ways. It turns out to be, you know, very frustrating form of the uh, uh, part of the Republic because mm -hmm. people um, have a really difficult time interpreting uh, what. Um, Swinburne, or what Plato is <laughs> after there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no. and, and like Plotinus, you know, in the Aeneid, yeah. you know, also has this sort of idea. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, all right. So that's, so this meets the posting criterion, even though it seems odd, it meets the criterion. And so yeah. it could be assessed like any other, you know, testable theory after meeting this criterion. So the second one you have is, is atheism or naturalism. Yeah. So naturalism. And this is the idea that fundamentally, uh, there, so you, you have to kind of go into this in stages, like so. Naturalism is the idea that fundamentally, right, um, there are just um, non-intentional um, entities and properties, yeah. right? So there, there are no fundamental um, in terms of fundamental pro properties. There's, you know, the universe isn't somehow or another, right, um, a manifestation of normative property. It's not a manifestation of, you know, uh, the the will of a um, uh, of a personal being, right? Uh, the universe is fundamentally, you know, physical object that has physical characteristics, and we can explain what happens in the universe in terms of, um, you, know, um, you know, these uh, uh, fundamental features of the universe in terms of laws and physical properties. So, so that's naturalism in general, but um, there are a lot of different versions of naturalism. So there's um, uh, there's what's known as like single universe naturalism. There's multi universe naturalism, and so what in the paper I argue is that the most um, single universe naturalism doesn't meet what we're calling the posting criteria, because it posits just one universe, mm -hmm. right? That has um, so so you have single universe naturalism, and you can think it, either it's an eternal version yeah. or a version that begins, you know, at some point. And I just think, look, you know, if it begins at a, at a particular point, that violates the posting criteria, yeah. right? Because you, <laughs> you don't get something out of nothing. I mean, that's, yeah. that's you know, okay. So that that's off the table, right? And then if it's an internal single universe model, then the question is, well, why does the universe have the particular properties that yeah. it has? So we get existence, but we don't get all these other contingencies. Yeah. And then you have the nature of the universe, and that has all these sort of, contingencies to them that seem to be brute stipulations, right, of single universe naturalism. Yeah. And so um, let me just pause for a minute and just say, you know, uh, the contemporary debate in philosophy of religion seems to agree that a single universe naturalism um, is the only way to be a naturalist, then uh, it's just not a very plausible, yeah. right? Um, so a more plausible form of naturalism is committed to the idea that like some sort of principle of plenitude where right every natural uh, possibility right is um, realized right and the difference between our world and some other possible world is really just the difference between you know a, a location difference we're here that other universe is over there of course they're not spatial temporal relations yeah. you know between these universes but you know the idea is that um, naturalism is committed to the idea that look every contingent possibility is realized yeah. right someplace or another so it's almost like the naturalist is saying okay well look um here's the way the world is fundamentally the world exists that's yeah. a fact right yeah. we're not going to explain why it exists but um every way the world could be is realized somewhere or other. yeah so is uh, so if I'm understanding this correctly, so uh, why is this universe exist and why is it the way it is? You basically say, well, the universe just exists. That's my my proof fact. But the universe is such a way that it will just realize anything about itself. So it's like this constant 
self-generating machine that's going to realize any possibility that it could possibly so humans with brains and a heart like i was just one of an infinite yeah. amount of possibilities yeah. that the universe could have realized and therefore it realized yeah. that yeah yeah it's like you know you're in a in a mall and you're standing in front of a sign and it says like here i am and you're like why am i here <laughs> right and it's like well you know if you were looking at that sign over there you would have been over there it's just you know you're here and not there um, gotcha. Okay, yeah. so so we're going to be looking at this, I'll just call like this multiverse naturalism, or naturalism for short, as being yeah. another uh, theory that meets the posting criteria, just has one sort of uh, contingency, and that is just that the universe is. Um, yeah. Now, this this next one, we have theism. Uh, so yeah, tell me why I think theism should be on this list of grand theories of everything. Yeah, so theism, um, you know, yeah. So this is a this is a definitely uh, influenced by Swinburne. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Swinburne has a particular way of thinking about theism. So you can think about theism in terms of like the standard omni properties, right? So omniscient, you know, omnipotent and omnibenevolent, you know, all powerful, you know, all knowing and all good, um, and then creator of the universe, and you know, all these other properties. And you can think of these in a way um, as kind of the assemblage, right, of different properties. Yeah. Right. And when you begin to think about it like that, right, it looks like, OK, well, why are these um, why are these like if you, you think about this in sort of a Lego block model? Yeah. Right. So theism is the hypothesis that this giant Lego block exists with these knowledge properties and these goodness properties. Right. And you know, these power properties and, then you know, maybe some other properties thrown in there and you think, OK, well, that looks like. Um, something that cries out for explanation why all these properties, right, are um, 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 unified in a single thing, yeah. right? And uh, Swinburne thinks that this is um, not an adequate way to think about the core theistic hypothesis, that yeah. the core theistic hypothesis is that there's one substance with one property of pure, limitless, intentional power. Okay. Right? So this is a being, right, you posit a... Uh, a, a being that has right the power of intentional prop uh, has the um, the property of intentional power, so this being can uh, 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 form intentions, perform actions, mm -hmm. right? Uh, will have you know in order to form an intention, right? You have to have something like a belief, a desire, and a purpose. You know, um, maybe that's somehow or another just the structure of intention, mm -hmm. right? And there are no limitations, right, to this being's um, intentional power. Yeah. So whatever they intend to do, right, they can do. Um, yeah. When they, you know, form a question or when it <laughs> forms a question, yeah. right, um, there's nothing sort of blocking its ability to answer that question, yeah. right, and so on. And so if you think about, you know, the postulation of, you know, um, a substance with one property, uh, pure intentional power, right, that's limitless, that meets, uh, you know, the post in criteria. Mm -hmm. And then you can give this kind of argument where all the traditional properties of theism fall out of that, um, you know, core um, uh, yeah. limitless, you know, property. Yeah, so a potential problem with thinking of theism as, as meeting the post and criterion is that, I mean, it seems like God has all of these, you know, properties and like, yeah, everybody who studies the doctrine of God, it's, it's pretty complex, but on, on Swinburne's doctrine of God, there's just one property. And that's yep. pure, limitless, intentional power. Yep. Um, and so so I think that, so let's just assume that that solves the uh, property problem. One of the things I was thinking when I was reading your paper is, well, for Christian theism, at least, um, you do have a limitation within the relations uh, that we have yeah. with God. So you have yeah. three persons and, and three relations. So yeah. I guess would that jeopardize uh, Christian theism within uh, meeting the post and criterion because it seems like now you have this arbitrary <laughs> contingency. This is the Spinoza question. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, how much of a uh, you know radical are you, Spinoza? <laughs> uh, and now, um, yeah, the way I think about this is, um, I think about like the projects that I'm the project that I'm engaged here is different from the the project of you know arguing you know for for maybe Christian theism, you mm -hmm. know. And so what I'm thinking is, um, here's a general way to describe the core theistic commitment that is um, at least um, part of the background yeah. to, 
to you know Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, yeah. you know, and some forms of theistic, you know, Hinduism. Yeah. Right. And so it provides you know a plausible um, starting point. Say, okay, you know, um, if you're if you're thinking, all right, well, why well, think there's a God at all? Right. And then this is where, you know, this project would come in. Right. And then maybe you get to the point where you're thinking, okay, well, it's really plausible that there's a God. And so then that's when, you know, the second part of the Swinburne project comes into play. Yeah. So Swinburne has his trilogy, which is broadly on, you know, um, the coherence of theism, the existence of God, and then the role between faith and reason. And then he has the four volumes that are devoted to Christian uh, theology, kind of doing what's known as philosophical theology, trying to provide a philosophical justification for the particular claims. Gotcha. Um, so to answer your question, I don't think it's uh, in conflict, but, you know, at this stage in, um, in sort of the, w the way I see the project developing, um, it's not something that would uniquely, I think, support one version of theism over another. Gotcha. And uh, is this a like a project that you plan on pursuing so that you will, you know, move on from this paper or book or whatever to, uh, you know, a defense of, you know, the coherence of theism? I hope so. Okay. You know, it, it's a, it's a long process. You know, I'm in the, I'm writing a book um, on um, the existence of God using kind of confirmation theory, gotcha. uh, paying attention to some subtleties that, you know, I think have been missed by um, yeah. you know, previous uses of that. And so, um, I keep telling people that, yeah, I'll have this book done next year, but I've been saying that for about three years now. <laughs> so, so when you pick up the, the project after, like, so you do the existence and then you do coherence. Um, I mean, is that a question that you plan on like tackling, you know, more in depth, like, okay, you know, just why is it that we seem to have this kind of like brute contingency about the, the persons in the Godhead? Yeah. I, you know, honestly, I'm not sure. I would be comfortable describing it as a, a brute contingency. I mean, Swinburne has this argument that in virtue of being um, uh, and being a perfect love, yeah. a perfect love is diffusive and has to um, have, in a way, co-equals. Um, and then Swinburne gives an argument that um, I'm not. I'm not endorsing this argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he gives an argument that okay, well. The doctrine of Trin Trinity falls out of that. And um, I mean, I think maybe in the future, what I would, you know, a way to sort of get into the that argument is, um, or to get into this issue is, is to work on that argument. Um, okay. Gotcha. I'm not sure what I think about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if you see that like as a vital part of the project. That's, that's all I was asking for. But. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, I mean, if you take this idea that like, you know, <laughs> contingencies are to be avoided as much as possible, uh, then you kind of get yourself into, you know, uh, a, a very substantive project where you're like, okay, well, why this? Why that? Why that? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So so now we have our list, right? But, and, and this list is good, right? Because we only have three things. And mm -hmm. I mean, we could just say all of these things are equally probable. And, and that would be a good setting because now you got like 0.33, probability here, 0.33, you get, everybody gets their fair share of probability and it's like, okay, now let's put these theories to work. But then, you know, somebody comes along and they say, well, that's not fair. You know, my worldview or grand theory didn't get its, it didn't get its fair shake, <laughs> the probabilities. Uh, yeah. So like you bring up the, the Zoroastrian dualist, <laughs> like what about the Zoroastrian dualist? First of all, would you tell me like what inspired that bit, you know, the, the bit about the Zoroastrian dualism? As, as, yeah, uh, so... I'm trying to remember. I think there is, yeah, there, I'm trying to remember the order, uh, the order in which I came up with it. I, it may have been that I, um, so the general problem is just like, what about other theories? You yeah. know, people have pressed, pressed, you know, that on me uh, for a while. And what I wanted to do is, is take an example, some examples from history of religion, mm -hmm. from, you know, philosophy, of things that people have advocated for and say, well, does this theory, right, get some share of the probability? Um, and the Zoroastrian dualism um, uh, is just an example of, you know, a view that people have held, you know, uh, and uh, there's still, I guess, Zoroastrians out there. Um, 
And there was a paper published, I think, in Religious Studies um, called like In Defense of Zoroastrian okay. Dualism. Uh, and so I figured that would be a good way um, uh, to develop it. And it turns out it's a really interesting view. I mean, honestly, I didn't know quite that much about it, but the Zoroastrian dualist posits something like theism, but then uh, another finite, um, uncreated force of evil. Um, and so um, in the paper, I just say, okay, well, look, here's the view. And it posits like this, um, it posits fundamentally two entities, one of which is an uncreated being a finite power, and that uh, you know violates the posting criteria for the same reasons I've said before. It's just a, it's a postulation of a um, a brute contingency. Yeah. Um, and you know it's what what's you know what's interesting about um, the criteria that I'm using is that it doesn't come out of thin air. I mean, people have criticized Zoroastrian dualism precisely on these grounds. Yeah. And a lot of like internal criticisms, right, of the view is like, okay, well, you know. <laughs> why, right, this, you know, force of um, evil that has finite power that's uncreative, you know, that doesn't quite, you know, um, we want some sort of explanation for why that being uh, comes about. And so what you see is like, Ed, you see like, you know, these internal debates mm -hmm. among religious traditions where they're trying to work out, you know, better kinds of, you know, um, a ways to formulate the view mm -hmm. that reduces some of the, um, you know, the limitations, the contingencies yeah. that you see in the view. And, you know, honestly, you see this kind of process too in, you know, just the way, you know, people write books and assess books. Like you yeah. read a novel, you know, and you're like, oh, well, this character did did something that, you know, completely doesn't make sense, you know, mm -hmm. given what we know, or his, his character, you know, has this feature that doesn't fit with the rest of the features, you know. And I think this is just another example of using this kind of, you know, reasoning to think, oh, it'd be a better yeah. story. Right, if you were somehow or not, somehow or another able to integrate right those character features into something that sort of was coherent, made yeah. sense. Yeah. So, so these last couple examples are just kind of like test cases to show, like, hey, you know, according to this criterion, and it's already been used in other you know uh, venues or discussions. But according to this criterion, this is why these stories or these theories don't hold up as grand theories of everything. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and so, so if we just left it as is. You say, look, now you got these three grand theories, you know, to play ball with. Um, that's really good. They all start off with, you know, these really, uh, you know, it seems like at least high probabilities. You know, this is a 0.33 chance probability that theism yeah. is the theory of everything and that everybody you could just assume that that's true for the sake of argument. It would seem like we'd be a good place. <laughs> now, would you say that when you begin to take in, you know, some of the evidence, uh, and like, so, for example, talk about like the arguments from natural theology. Do you think that would rule out something like axiarchism and then put us like e e even uh, uh, see, because in my mind, when I was looking at these three views, I was thinking, well, that's too many still. But when you take <laughs> into account the evidence, you I think you'd be left with two, you know, either theism yeah. or naturalism. So what, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Uh, that's, you know, the part of the project that I'm working on right now mm -hmm. is like how the evidence bears on these views. Yeah. But if you think about like, what's the evidence that requires explanation? Um, you think about, okay, well, you know, why does the universe have the particular features that it has, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it thinks, well, theism and this, you know, form of naturalism both explain uh, those features fairly well. I mean, naturalism is going to apply, right? Yeah. That whatever universe, you know, that every contingent possibility is going to be realized in some universe or another. And so the fact that we find ourselves in this universe Right, with these particular things doesn't in a way to cry out for special explanation because you know there's another universe right over there right that has those properties but then you start thinking about um you know um questions of um you know uh why why do we have people um that you know um have beliefs and experiences right yeah uh, inform meaningful relationships stuff like that you know, how does that figure into, you know, the evaluation of the view? Um, you might think that there's some differential, you know, um, um, you know, evidential power with respect to say, yeah. you know, uh, axiarchism and theism. Um, one particular way to think about this is um, with the problem of evil, yeah. right? So axiarchism, right, doesn't explain, you know, why 
um, you know, there's evil. Um, it's interesting, like, you know, um, naturalism, I mean, this, this form of naturalism is a really sort of powerful form of naturalism says, look, every contingent possibility, right, is realized someplace or other. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not honestly quite sure, you know, how to think about um, that um, particular aspect. I mean, one of the one of the um, forms of evidence that I do think uh, favors theism over uh, this form of naturalism is religious experience. Gotcha. And so the way Swinburne uh, thinks about the project in the existence of God, and I don't think a lot of people really realize this, is that he thinks that it just puts a person in um, a position to exercise faith and to uh, you know realize. Um, what are you know to sort of be open to religious experience okay and then religious experience would would um you know um um significantly boost yeah you know, you know your your credence in theism yeah. I mean, in a way in a way that's not it, it, i mean in a way that's quite not you know the accurate way to think about it because it's not like you know you know when i'm you know you know when my wife and i you know uh, we, when we weren't married, you know, we met, you know, it's not like I'm keeping an Excel spreadsheet and updating my basis theorem, you know, yeah. you know, but, you know, like you get to a certain point where you're like, you know, you have these kind of, you know, general background beliefs that make certain things plausible. And then, you yeah. know, the magic happens. Yeah. Right. And, and so, you know, that's kind of the way I think about it is like, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the philosophy here, you know, in terms of the methodology is sort of like clearing away, yeah. you know, various objections and, yeah. and, and, and sort of concerns that people even like myself, I mean, you know, had, you know, before, um, you know, before, you know, you know, really understood what, you know, how apologetics and you know, yeah. philosophy and you know, stuff like that, you know, it just clears the ground in a way, you know, so that you can then, um, you know, in a way, live, you know, yeah. the proper life of faith. Gotcha. And so in talking about, you know, kind of, I guess, eliminating some of these uh, plausibility barriers, uh, but also like eliminating um, some of these competing hypotheses, do you think that, uh, for example, like a cosmological argument uh, or like a Kalam cosmological argument would count against a view like axiarchism? Because it would seem, I guess, like, if, if something like that goes through, you know, even just the philosophical arguments alone, you know, that, you know, the, it, the universe existing for an infinite, you know, time is impossible to regress or something like that, uh, yeah. that that would seem to account, count against axiarchism. Because I, I was assuming that this view would take it that the universe has to have always existed. Yeah, so axiarchism, um, it's interesting, like, it, it might, so one of the ways, uh, one of the things that I've heard is that axiarchism might in a way be a, a general view, which has, you know, both like naturalistic and theistic, you know, versions. Um, but if you think about it, just in terms of like the history of religion, you might think that um, in some way or another, yeah, the universe is always that exists and it has these particular features it has because it's good that it has. So yeah. it can kind of a, um, like committed to a single universe, single existing universe. Yeah. Um, and, but then, you know, like, why does it have these features? Well, it's just good. You know, it's mm -hmm. like the, in a way the 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 creative energy of whatever, you know, Plato calls like the form of the good has always existed, right? Has always, you know, exuded the power it has. And then, you know, he asked, well, how does that fit with, you know, um, you know the kind of arguments that Bill Craig gives, you know, with the Kalam and, know all the all the worries there and um yeah i mean if you think those arguments work and then, then yeah i mean you're yeah. gonna get um some um disconfirmation for that view yeah gotcha so now i want to think about like uh i guess like eliminating theism <laughs> from, so let's say we were to hit to eliminate theism from from this grant so so i already talked about how like there seems like maybe there's this contingency with the the number of persons in the godhead I mean, is there any other concerns you have about, I guess, certain understandings of theism that, that uh, or like, I guess, certain uh, models of God that may kind of, I guess, just be incompatible as a theory of everything? So like, for example, uh, I think you mentioned um, the existence of God as being uh, 
like a, a logical contingency or something like that. And so like, I don't know Swinburne's view on like the contingency of God's existence or anything like that. But from what I understand, he has like a controversial opinion on whether or not God is a metaphysically necessary being. Yeah. So, so he thinks that, um, you know, he thinks that um, the existence of God isn't in a way uh, logically necessary. Um, it's not, um, it's a, it's a brute contingent fact. Right, that God exists. Um, so, you know, if you go in for something like the ontological argument, right, you think, well, God's a metaphysically necessary being exists in all possible worlds, right, then um, in a way what you're doing is, is uh, you're not in the same um, sort of game that what, you know, what we're doing here with the use of confirmation theory. Because what we're doing is you're thinking, okay, what are the plausible options okay. on offer, right? And if you have something like a, you know, ontological argument that works, right? Then, you know, you're like, well, why am I wasting my time with this, right? Yeah. You know, God metaphysically necessary pain. It's just an all possible world. Yeah. So boom, we're done, right? Um, you know, and so, so I think, um, you know, I, I think that there's certain kind of assumptions that are in the background yeah. you know, with the use of confirmation theory, um, you know, that, um, yeah, are, you know, in a way incompatible with other sort of models of thinking about, you know, God's existence, but yeah. um, that they're widely shared by a number of people. Gotcha. Gotcha. So are you in a rush right now? Because I got like a couple more things that I'm thinking about. As you're speaking. So I have a meeting at two, so I could talk until two. Okay. So, uh, so my other question then on that, um, so, so we could just assume an ontological argument and then like be like, boom, so we have no contingencies at all. We just have this necessary being and yeah. everybody else has yeah. contingencies. Uh, but like if we're going to play like fair, I guess, you know, or, or not assume that this is actually a plausible argument uh, to most people, then we don't want to assume that out of the gate. Um, so I guess th thinking about uh, like different models of God that, that may not work on this theory, what do you think of, of and I know Swinburne, um, I think Swinburne is a nominalist, right? So like he doesn't believe in any properties. Yeah, it's been a long time since I, you know, actually I don't know. <laughs> okay, so so for example, like I know Craig basically, like runs this argument where he basically says, you know, properties don't really exist, but as a, a figure of speech, we can, you know, uh, use property talk to, you know, I guess like model different aspects. But God is ultimately a simple being, and he doesn't mean that in a Thomistic sense. He means like the same way that a mind is a simple immaterial you know, thing yeah. or entity. Yeah. So I guess if, if you did that move, would that kind of get you what Swinburne is after with the whole God only has one property? And that's, you know, uh, limit, like, yeah, and, and not that it's the same exact thing, but in terms of, well, if we're not on the list of our properties, then we don't even have to explain that because that's just not there, even with respect to theism. Yeah, I would want to know, you know, honestly, like, that is an area of my philosophical education that I haven't explored in much detail, okay. right? So I, I would want to know sort of more about, you know, how, um, you know, how that would work given the kind of, you know, um, the constraints I'm thinking on, you know, confirmation theory, you know, how the, um, if you're an anomalist, right, does that, apply, does that imply that, right, you know, um, there are no property limitations, right? You know, that yeah. there's, um, you know, how do you think about contingencies yeah. right? on that sort of view? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and how are you thinking about, if you're a nominalist about properties, you know, um, it would seem weird to me to be a, um, like a Cartesian about substances, right? For example. Oh, okay, gotcha. And so, uh, you know, I, I'd want to know more about you know, just, I just want to, you know, know more about the metaphysics and how to think about, you know, what's going on with the idea that you're positing, if you think about theism as a hypothesis, a nominalism, you're positing a simple being. So what are you saying? That there's fundamentally a substance. Yeah. The substance has um, um, various features. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To it that somehow or another, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I want to know more. Okay. So, no, it's interesting. Like, 
I was talking to Marilyn McCord Adams many years ago, and I was telling her like when. So that's like an awesome way to start a story. Oh, I was talking to Marilyn McCord. Yeah, Adams. And, uh, yeah. So we we were very fortunate to uh, overlap for a period. Um, I was on a sabbatical, and and her and her husband were were teaching there, and uh, yeah, she was just an amazing lady. But she, um, we went out to, uh, uh, I think it was either coffee or lunch. I can't remember, but. Um, I was telling her like when people start talking about theistic metaphysics, especially from like in a, you know, like a medieval background, like, you know, yeah. my eyes start glazing over and I'm like, I'm just losing my grip yeah. on like how to think about some of this stuff, you know? And she's like, uh, we were, we were talking about simplicity in particular and the Lego model that I gave you was the, uh, was actually her example. Yeah. You know, she's like, well, here's the way I think about it. I think about what people were complaining about with like the simplicity stuff is, you know, like God's like a big Lego block. You know, I'm like, oh, I understand that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but yeah, now, you know, Tim Paul, um, who is at, mm -hmm. um, um, is he up in Minnesota? Yeah, at, St. Thomas, I think. Yeah, St. Thomas. Yeah, he knows this stuff really well. And I, I think really highly of them. Yeah, yeah, like on that note, uh, because one of the, I guess, where my mind is going, so trying to get after theism, you know, I guess I would want to get after theism in a way that doesn't commit me to this one property of, you know, uh, like like maybe there's a, another formulation of theism that is just as simple, you know, as, as an explanation. And then also on the other end of that, you know, I'm just wondering, like, you know, this probably rules out some uh, doctrines of God. So, for example, you know, like Mormonism or something like that, you know, like that's one that obviously would be ruled out. But uh even maybe even uh, uh, a more Thomistic conception of God would fall under axiarchism, more under more more so than it would fall under uh, what we're construing as theism. Um, because I, I would assume that they wouldn't like to construe that. For example, I mean, maybe yeah. I would have. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly going to push uh, against. It's definitely going to push against certain conceptions of theism. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's going to push against like process theology views, and yeah. you know, um, it will push against you know certain views of thinking about God as having desires, you know, where these are, um, uh, you know, kind of, um, I don't know, like, like you, you think of like a, a desire as almost like, like a lava lamp, you know, yeah. where it somehow or another just pops out of nowhere, you know, yeah. and yeah. Uh, bubbles up here and bubbles up there. I mean, yeah. So on this kind of model of thinking about theism, I mean, it, I think about very much sort of in the Leibnizian tradition, like, you know, you're thinking about, you know, God almost as if, you know, the hypothesis of a, um, of uh, this, you know, ultimately, you know, coherent uh, substance where in a way all its features are unified together and flow from a central essence. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, people have been thinking about theology for many years. Yeah. And so, you know, you got to kind of just name that, you know, go through the different views and say, okay, is this consistent? Is yeah. that, you know, inconsistent? You know. Well, I appreciate this, Dr. Poston. We're going to do an outro for the YouTube, but me and you will still be on Zoom for a couple minutes if that's okay. okay. Um, that's I do good. want to encourage you guys to check out Dr. Poston's uh, website. I have that linked in the description. Uh, you can find the article that we've been discussing. I think it should be the third or fourth article on those links. Um, but you could also just find links to tons of stuff on there. And so that's a really great resource if you're especially interested in the area of epistemology. Also, I want to remind you guys that tomorrow we'll be back with Dr. Drew Johnson. And we're going to be talking about his work on building a biblical philosophy. So he's done a lot of work on epistemology and metaphysics in the Old Testament and New Testament. So we're going to be discussing some of those things tomorrow. And as always, if you click that GoFundMe link, you can help support me and furthering my education. So I look forward to seeing you guys back tomorrow and you be.